Uh, let's see. I'm going to start with mean temperatures, and uh, I've got this is for the uh, the lower 48, but these are spring temperatures, so the months of uh, of March, April, and May all together, and collectively what they say for the Great Lakes Basin here, if uh, you concentrate on this part of the the country, is that our our mean temperatures for the season were were actually fairly close to normal, and that that followed up a generally a milder than normal winter. Uh, May or uh, March in, uh, was uh, milder than normal, but it's frequently frequently is the case. Uh, the even though the overall long term normals came out near normal, uh, it was it was very very often not the case, and that's uh, that's where I'm going to go next here. After a warmer than normal March, we had uh, April followed up in the basin, colder than normal, and then in May we had some very very interesting weather. Uh, uh, I guess with a, uh, an underline, much, much below normal, colder than normal, actually like late winter-like for the first half of the month. And then we had a big change uh, in the jet stream over the region and we ended up much above normal. So again, even though our means ended up close to normal, it was, uh, it was really anything but. And June so far, uh, depending on where you are, has, has actually been uh, fairly close to normal as well. We've seen more of these fluctuations from above or much above to much below normal. So. Again, even though it all averages out, uh, we've we've been on on many different sides of the uh, uh, of the norm for for temperature. Uh, for precipitation, I think that's that's really where most of our attention is, uh, at least for this discussion for the next few minutes here. And I'd like to start by with some context by reminding everyone that we've come out well. We've really come off of the the uh, wettest period on record. It, it, it and a number of ways you can define that. Certainly, the the wettest five year period. Uh, 2019 is a single year, as you can see in the graphic here from Michigan, for much of the basin was the wettest year on record. And it was not just a little bit, it was a, it broke or shattered the record here uh, in Michigan. But we've come off of a, uh, an unusually wet, uh, wet stretch of decades here, the last 20 to 30 years, especially with, uh, you can see the blue line here indicating the long-term normal for Michigan increasing significantly here. Again, especially over the last couple of decades and then 2019 is outlined here. So that that brings you through the end of the calendar year in 2019. Well, the as we we look now into the most more recent past, our precipitation totals over most of the region here have fallen off. Certainly of these uh, these record breaking uh, rates that we saw last year, and 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 large portions of the region will see. Uh, it is it's it's dried off and actually become or well certainly a lot less than before but even below the normal there were two uh interesting events i'm gonna i'm gonna highlight those one was a a major heavy rain event back in the middle of may the 17th through the 19th of may and uh this is this type of an event where we have a well it was a, a very very strong mid-level mid-latitude uh trough event or trough uh that, that uh, strengthen this particular surface feature but the the big uh, i think the big distinction with this event was the moisture draw out of the gulf of mexico and actually it had a tropical connection with the remnants of tropical storm alberto here for these couple days all of this moisture influx up into the upper midwest led to a very very heavy rain event and you can see that on the left here with much of uh, at least the central and southwestern portions of the great lakes basin receiving at least two inches. In some cases, we had over five inches uh, of rain reported here over a large area. And this is this is a much larger area than we typically see impacted. But again, the uh, the key to this was the connection with the subtropics here. And if you're actually looking at this map on the right here, this is precipitable water. This is how much water vapor is in the troposphere where most all of our weather takes place and gives us an idea about how much of the that water vapor, the raw material for precipitation is present. If you're uh, you're really looking at the map, you can also see it's not the only atmospheric river. Uh, you can see why they call these events atmospheric rivers. There's another one out on the west coast. I, I don't recall ever seeing this before, but you can see one coming into the California coast at the same time. That's uh, so you got sort of a two for one bonus. But regardless, we had uh, this is this is arguably the largest precipitation event we've had uh, during the 2020 calendar year across the upper Midwest, and it was again related to this. Uh, this atmospheric river event. We also had a visit from another tropical system, and that was the remnants of uh, tropical, what was tropical storm Cristobal, uh, which made landfall in southern Louisiana uh, on the uh, 8th of June. 
and then took a very, very interesting path. You can, that's in the upper left here, uh, courtesy of the National Weather Service, uh, a very, very unusual path. And the reason I say that is if we're looking here at the climatology of all the paths that uh, landfalling tropical disturbances have made in the Northwestern Atlantic, and you can see the vast majority of those stay down along the Gulf or in the Southeastern US. A few make it up into the Midwest, and a very, very few you can see make it up way up towards, uh, well, at least the upper part of the Great Lakes Basin. And Cristobal was one of those. And, and uh, again, depending on how you define it, it was one of the, the most northwesternmost paths ever taken by a tropical disturbance, at least in the last century. Uh, there, was quite, there was some very, very heavy rainfall associated with, uh, with this disturbance. You can see that on the right-hand side here. These are precipitation totals for this event. And you can see the heaviest precipitation fell right along the path up through Missouri, eastern Iowa, uh, into northern Wisconsin, upper peninsula of Michigan, and then on up into Ontario. But again, another very large event. You can see a large area, the central parts, uh, southwestern parts of the basin, the Great Lakes Basin, all received at least one inch. In some cases, uh, there was more than uh, four inches of, uh, of rainfall with this system. So there were two major major precipitation events, but I think this is really tells the story of where we are right now and really what's happened, especially over the last couple months. And what you see here now for the basin, these are precipitation totals, and I've got the, uh, the basin here outlined in the dark black, and uh, a fairly wide range of uh, precipitation totals ranging from less than 10 inches here up in the far northwestern corners of the basin, uh, the Arrowhead of Minnesota, and into western Ontario to, uh, to more than 20 inches. And the heaviest uh, precipitation during this time frame, again, back to about the beginning of the calendar year here, was across the southwestern uh, portion of, of the area. And a lot of that had to do with two of the, the well, at least one of the events that you just saw. Uh, so again, uh, wide, uh, wide variation. And uh, then to put everything in perspective on the right-hand side, the panel here, these are departures from normal across the basin. And the uh, greens are above normal totals or greater than normal totals for the long term versus the long term average. And the browns are the opposite or deficits. And you can see for the basin as a whole that uh, most of it is in the brown. And, and much of it uh, we can see, especially in the northwestern part of the basin here, much of that area from three to six inches below or behind the uh, long term normal. The only area that really had or the larger area that had above normal, like once again, down here in the southwest portions of Wisconsin uh, and Southwest Michigan. So if we did all the totals here together, uh, our, the basin has actually dropped off, not only from the record levels that we saw last year, but actually below the long-term normal. So it's, it's uh, the water uh, into the landscape, the supply has, has really, really fallen off here over the last couple of months. As a result of that, uh, there have been some significant changes and I'm gonna show you here uh, on the left-hand side here, soil moisture changes over the last couple of months, and then our surface water stream flow conditions on the right. But uh, uh, remember here in our last update back in April, much of the upper Midwest and certainly much of the Great Lakes Basin, central and western portions of it, were at or near record levels for, uh, again, for soil moisture in the top uh, uh, five feet or so of the soil profile. Uh, but that, and in many areas, especially in the central part of the basin, you can still see it is above the long-term normal. However, if you look at the relative change uh, that we've had since the end of March, you can see that much of the basin and much of the Midwest, for that matter, has dropped off uh, significantly from uh, earlier levels of, of soil moisture. And uh, another reflection of that in terms of our surface water stream flow conditions, you can see that there are still some uh, rivers and streams, in, uh, especially in Wisconsin into upper Michigan, that are still above uh, normal, considerably above normal, 70th, 80th, 90th percentile. A lot of near normals between the 25th and the 75th percentile here in, uh, in Michigan and surrounding areas, uh, well, in, into Wisconsin, Ohio, and over into Pennsylvania. And then there are some areas that now have dropped down to below normal uh, levels. And that would be here, once again, the far western portion of the basin, Arrowhead of Minnesota, where there's some actually down in the 10th percentile or less, and then along uh, both Lake Erie and Ontario in the far east along the lower lakes, they've also dropped down now to below normal levels. Again, given some of the, the drier than normal conditions that we've had over the last few months. One last comment on that, the most recent uh, uh, version of the US Drought Monitor now 
is showing uh, abnormally dry areas. This has come relatively quick over the last few weeks. Uh, the driest part of the basin here, and not surprisingly again, up in northern Minnesota where you can see there is uh, an area of D1 moderate drought now showing up given this uh, this dryness, but also uh, other areas of abnormal dryness down here, Indiana, into southern Michigan, uh, and then also over portions of the far, the lower lakes uh, in New York and Pennsylvania. So pretty significant changes have taken place just in the last several weeks given this uh, the drier than normal trend. One other strange one, and something you may have noticed, but uh, it has been, if it seemed uh, windier than normal over the last several weeks and actually the last few months, uh, well, there's there's a reason for it. It, it, it was, uh, in most of the region, it was a windier than normal spring. This is looking at near surface winds uh, from March through May of this year. And any areas where we have this uh, blue or purple coloring, it indicates the winds have been uh, stronger than normal. And that, uh, that has been uh, especially the case in May and even into June as well. An uh, unusually strong jet stream and a lot of high amplitude flow of the jet stream is probably behind this. But uh, if it seemed windier than normal, it was. And that's a big deal because when we have lake levels at or near record levels as they have been, anytime we have wind uh, or higher winds, we have problems with flooding along the shores. And so I, uh, we, we do have evidence here, at least meteorologically, that things have been windier than normal. Well, let's. Uh, I'm going to finish off here by looking where, uh, where the outlook suggests that we're headed. Uh, and I'm gonna start with a look at the equatorial Pacific and the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's uh, one of the most, uh, well, certainly widely used tools uh, available for the long lead or long range forecast. And we have been, uh, the, the ENSO uh, index itself in the Pacific has been neutral uh, as of recently, uh, but there are some changes here suggested. On the left-hand side here, you see the actual sea surface temperatures here in the upper left. And then the lower left, you see these are anomalies. Uh, so the current sea surface temperature minus the long-term normal. And this is uh, running a time lapse from early April through last week. And I guess I'll bring your attention here to the equatorial uh, eastern part of the Pacific. And you can see over the last few weeks here that there's been the development of some cooler than normal sea surface temperatures here. And that is playing a little bit of a role, at least in terms of the outlook. Our combined uh, official outlook for uh, the ENSO index here over the next, uh, well, half year or longer here suggests that uh, while we are currently in neutral conditions, and that's what the gray bars here indicate, that uh, this cool of the normal water here is one of the landmarks, uh, signatures of uh, La Nina conditions. And you can see as we get into the late summer and early fall, and even into the upcoming winter, the probabilities or the odds of a La Nina, out of a La Nina event increase here and are almost equal or even a little bit above what those are for uh, neutral conditions. Right now, the uh, the thought is that it would not be a strong La Nina, maybe a, a marginal one, but still it is a change from where we've been over much of the last several months. And overall, as we look at the, the actual weather and climate outlooks here for the next several months, it turns out that ENSO does not play a, a major role because of this. It's still largely neutral. So most of these outlooks that we're going to be looking at here are the result of the numerical uh, forecast model guidance and longer term trends, especially decadal type trends. I'm gonna start with the outlook for July, which is on top here, mean temperature forecast on the upper left, uh, precip mean, or precipitation totals on the upper right here for the month of July. And you can see that uh, above normal or warmer than normal conditions are favored essentially over the entire uh, lower 48 here, including uh, the Great Lakes region for precipitation uh, in the equal chances category. So no real forecast direction one way or the other. Uh, below that is the three month outlook for July through September. Lots of similarities here, still favoring uh, or increased odds of warmer than normal conditions for the uh, late summer and the beginning of the fall. And then you can see a hint here, the, uh, the some of this above normal precipitation or the odds favoring a little higher, the above normal precipitation category uh, shifted northward a little bit into at least portions of the Great Lakes Basin, but otherwise large portions still in the equal chances uh, for below, near, and above normal totals. Uh, then looking on beyond that for the fall into the early winter, uh, still some similarities, especially with temperatures, uh, still favoring or pushing in the direction of warmer than normal mean temperatures. Uh, once again, for precipitation, most of the basin is indicated to still remain or remain in the equal chances 
uh, category. So generally warmer than normal conditions here are, are, are what's expected. Uh, earlier outlooks had called uh, a little bit more for uh, the uh, above normal precipitation scenario, but, but the most recent, these are just as of last week, uh, most of the basin, once again, uh, no, no forecast direction. And with that, I'm going to wrap up and uh, well, I'll, we'll go on to the next speaker, but happy to answer any questions later on if I can. So thanks. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And Jeff, go ahead and go on mute. And John, uh, you're up next uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, take it away, John. All right. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, everybody can see my screen here. Um, see, I'm John Ellis, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my office is responsible for monitoring and forecasting uh, water levels on the Great Lakes. So I'll do my best here to put uh, in context, you know, the current water level situation, uh, you know, where that, I kind of put that in context of our past uh, recorded water levels and give you an update on what the forecast looks like moving forward. Okay, and um, you know, I know for those of you that may have been on the uh, uh, you know the first of the you know this series of webinars, you may get some repeat information here. Uh, but I want to cover some basics about the situation, some basic concepts. Yeah, I'm sure there are many of you that um, maybe your first time you know learning about Great Lakes level. So I just I'll go through some basics here right off the you know for the first half of the presentation. Um, and again, for those of you, uh, you know, that, you know, we probably have a wide range of people on the line here from various uh, portions of the basin. Uh, and you may be experiencing uh, or may have been experiencing issues in your specific area due to the high water. Uh, but, you know, certainly note that, you know, there's really no single point of the Great Lakes that's been, uh, you know, been immune to the issues due to high water. This has been a, a system wide event over the last uh, couple of years now with each of the Great Lakes experiencing uh, record or very close to record high levels. Well, I think all the lakes now have experienced record high levels over the last two years. So, uh, you know, there have been widespread and significant impacts all across uh, each of the lakes basins. And so let me, uh, you know, get into a little bit about why that's happening and uh, some of the basics of, you know, about monitoring water levels here on the system. Uh, the first thing I wanna point out here uh, what this graphic is just to make sure everybody understands just how large the Great Lakes uh, system really is. Uh, you know, one of the largest freshwater uh, systems on the planet. Um, you, know, you can see just the, you know, the, uh, the area and just the length of the system as water, you know, would flow its way from Lake Superior uh, down through the same areas river into Lakes Michigan Huron, you know, through the St. Clair River, Detroit River, uh, into Lake Erie, ultimately over Niagara Falls and into Lake Ontario and now the system to the St. Lawrence River. So you have this you know, very long uh, path of water, very large system. Um, and the thing I would point out here is there are two points along that chain where we can control outflow uh, from one lake into the next lake. Uh, and those are circled here. Uh, that's at the outlet of Lake Superior. Uh, the outflow uh, is controlled according to a set uh, international regulation plan. Uh, and then also at the very end of the system, uh, the outlet of Lake Ontario, that outflow is controlled. Uh, so all those points in between, uh, you know, are natural free flowing. There, there are no, there's no ability to control the outflow, uh, you know, the, the amount of water that leaves Lake Huron. Uh, there's no control over the amount of water that leaves Lake Erie. Um, so most of the system is, you know, really at the mercy of mother nature with very little influence or with, you know, we don't have very much uh, ability to influence the levels through this outflow regulation. So something to keep in mind as I uh, describe the water level fluctuations and some of the drivers. All right, some just, again, basic concepts on water levels here. Um, you know, I'll be mentioning uh, and I'll be showing data and information about water levels for each of the lakes. And when I talk about a water level of one of the lakes, I'll be referring to what we call a lake-wide average level. So there's a series of water level gauges all on the shoreline of the, you know, the U.S. portions and Canadian portions of the Great Lakes. And so each lake has a network of gauges that we 
uh, calculate, you know, that we use to calculate a lake-wide average value uh, for that specific lake. Uh, so that represents a calm, still, averaged elevation of that lake surface. Um, and, and it also, you know, we'll typically uh, roll those averages up into a, a daily average. So we'll be uh, tracking and plotting what the daily level of a lake is. Uh, we also roll that up into a monthly average uh, level for the lake, which uh, is useful for us when we're trying to do longer range forecasts, uh, like I'll show you in our six month forecast that we produce. Now, uh, you know, moving here into what drives water level fluctuation of the Great Lakes, and you can boil this down pretty simply uh, into, um, you know, into kind of a simple graphic here. You know, if you think about uh, the way water goes into and out of each of the lakes, um, you know, this sums it up here. You'll typically have water coming into the lake from the upstream lake in the system. Uh, you'll then have water just leaving that lake through its outlet. Um, you know, moving on to the next uh, lake in the system. Uh, and then you also have uh, the other three major components that we lump into a term called net basin supply. Um, and that's the water that's leaving off the lake surface through evaporation. Uh, it's the amount of water that is falling directly on the lake surface due to precipitation. And then the amount of water that's running off into that lake due to the, you know, the surrounding tributaries and watershed, you know, around that specific lake. So. Uh, you know, so I may re refer to net basin supply uh, here when I'm describing uh, how wet things have been or how dry things have been on the Great Lakes. Um, and that really sums up, uh, you know, all this water that uh, is driven by Mother Nature, whether it's, you know, it's the storms that move through or, uh, you know, maybe really warm water with cold air moving over top of it, driving evapor evaporation. So it really captures the, you know, the kind of climate nature controlled aspect of how much water uh, comes into or out of the system. The other, uh, the other basic point to point out about the Great Lakes is they typically follow uh, a natural pattern like you'd see in many other uh, natural, you know, inland lakes throughout the world. Uh, you know, we go through a seasonal pattern in the levels where uh, at the start of the calendar year, you're midwinter, uh, especially up here, uh, you know, on the Great Lakes, much of the precip is falling as snow. Uh, it's frozen, staying on the ground and not working its way into the lake. Uh, so it's really once you get into spring, uh, as that starts to melt and you get, uh, you know, more rain and you get that snow melt running off into the lakes, uh, you know, you'll start to see a seasonal rise to each of the lakes. Um, and that carries on, you know, the timing's a little different depending on which lake uh, you're on. Uh, but typically kind of somewhere in the summer to fall, you'll see uh, a seasonal peak. Uh, but then things start to dry up uh, with uh, increased evaporation later in the fall, less precipitation falling, uh, and the lake will begin, begin its seasonal decline. So in a normal year, you would see each of the lakes follow this rough uh, kind of a seasonal pattern, uh, just slightly shifted depending on which lake you're talking about. All right. Um, so this, uh, what, what we're looking at here um, is a, a graph showing the monthly means uh, for each of the lakes plotted back to the beginning of our period of record, which starts in 1918, all the way to present. So some things to point out uh, for those of you to, you know, that may may not be familiar with this. Um, you'll see, you know, how each lake have these kind of wrap it up and down squiggly lines, you know, so what you're seeing there are the, each of the individual seasonal patterns where, you know, the lakes are going through their annual kind of seasonal rise, seasonal fall. Uh, but then you'll notice that there are, uh, you know, sustained periods throughout, throughout that period of record where levels stay um, very high or very low for long stretches of time. Uh, you know, each of the lakes has its long-term average plotted uh, as that red line. And so, you can see, um, you know, again, you've got this this pattern where levels will will um, fluctuate between uh, periods of high, periods of low. Um, but looking at it and through analysis, there there really aren't any predictive cycles in there where you could say, aha, you know, we always spend 20 years above and then we go for 20 years below and back and forth. And you know, so there are certainly there's this pattern of you know we expect levels to continue to fluctuate through high and low water periods, but there's really not a predictive 
uh, nature to those to that pattern. Uh, pointing out a couple of uh, uh, you know kind of noteworthy patterns here or periods in the more recent future or more recent past. Uh, you know, pointing out one of these sustained low water periods. That's what we had just been coming off of uh, from the late 90s into the you know 2013 period. It was actually the longest sustained below average uh, period of water levels on the Great Lakes uh, for the Upper Lakes. Um, and then we transitioned into this into this really rapid rise. And this gets at what Jeff was showing, where we've we had had sustained wet. Uh, conditions across the Great Lakes, you know, over the last five years, oh, excuse me, that really have driven water levels back from this low water period to this high water period that we're seeing, um, and then circling, you know, where we are now, uh, where we've been dealing with record highs. Uh, the last thing I'll point out in this graph is you look at the peaks of where we are currently in 2020 uh, and where we were in 2019, uh, and look back and see that. Uh, Although we set some new record highs, uh, you can see other times in the period of record where it was very close to that. So, um, you know, again, we've we've been dealing with extremes, um, but there are also extremes that are similar to um, what the basins have experienced uh, over the last hundred years. All right, so moving forward now into more of an update on. Uh, on more more recent conditions and our forecasts moving forward. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the six month forecast uh, that we produce from the Army Corps and uh, coordinate with our Canadian counterparts. Um, and I'll orient you here on this first one uh, so that you understand what you're looking at. So uh, the red line are the recorded monthly mean water levels. Uh, we have it plotted back from 2018 to present. Uh, so that shows you the recorded level. Uh, the blue is what the long-term average uh, monthly mean levels would be. Uh, and then we also have these dashed uh, lines above and below the, uh, you know, the long-term average. And those show, you know, above, you know, at the top end, you know, they'll show the record uh, high monthly means along with the years that those were set. Uh, and then you also see where the record lows uh, are and the years that those were set. So. Uh, the things to point out here on Lake Superior, obviously last year, uh, you know, water levels were extremely high on Superior, setting new record highs through the spring and most of the summer. Uh, actually started off this year setting two new record highs in January and February. Uh, but then you're starting to see some of what Jeff was showing where, um, you know, we are starting to see some drying, especially in that, in the, you know, that far northern, northwestern part of the basin. Uh, and then you'll see also later on, you know, down in the other end of the basin and the kind of the Erie, Ontario range. Uh, but the Lake Superior Basin has been drying up a bit. So you can see starting, you know, March, April, May, uh, how levels haven't risen as sharply as they normally would. And that's given us some relief uh, back underneath, uh, you know, the record highs that we were dealing with. So the forecast moving forward, uh, you can see, uh, our green dashed line, that's our most probable forecast um, with the shaded range representing um, a 90% confidence band where if we see very wet conditions, we would expect to ride the top end of the band. Uh, if we ex experienced very dry conditions, we'd expect to follow more along that bottom part of the shaded zone. Um, so you can see the most probable uh, forecast for Superior would keep us uh, well off of the record highs, but still well above average. So, um, you know, still high water, uh, but at this point we're not forecasting the same level of extreme uh, that we were dealing with last year. Moving over to Lake Michigan and Huron, uh, this is where you'll see, you know, a little bit different story. And, uh, and again, that's because you know, again, Jeff summed it up well. We had a couple of events, you know, especially the one that really had a bullseye right over at the Michigan here on Basin. Uh, I've kept conditions there a little bit wetter, especially compared to Lake Superior. So um, you can see, you know, a couple of unique features here. One, we didn't quite set any new record highs last year on, on Lakes Michigan and Huron. Uh, I think that July value was less than an inch uh, but below a record high. Uh, but then we we had you know, almost no uh, seasonal decline. Again, we just had a, just a mild winter where, you know, a lot of the snow, you know, was melting and we were getting rain instead of snow. So we didn't see much of a seasonal decline at all. And that 
going to start 2020 much higher uh, than we did the previous year. And so, so far we've set record highs every month uh, in Michigan here on in 2020. Um, and conditions haven't been extremely wet, but they've still been slightly above average, which has kept the, you know, kept these water levels above, you know, again, continuing to be above the record high levels. So um, moving forward for the forecast for Michigan here on, uh, we're projecting that July peak uh, to be, you know, for the monthly mean in July to be when we're going to hit a seasonal peak. Uh, you can see that that's, you know, almost guaranteed to be a record. Um, maybe not quite as high as that October 1986 level, which is the highest uh, monthly mean in our period of record. Uh, I think the last forecast we completed at the start of June, uh, we were projecting to be, again, less than an inch, you know, beneath that. But uh, we'll see where we are. If we continue to get a dry in pattern, it, it may be even a little further off of that. But key takeaway for Michigan here on is levels are extremely high, you know, and again, ab above, uh, above the uh, recorded maximums. And so um, certainly still we expect that to be, you know, a continued major issue for those that have been dealing with the high water in the past in Michigan year. And we really think that's going to continue here uh, summer and into the fall of this year. A similar story, Lake St. Clair, uh, uh, this, you know, it's a much smaller lake, very heavily influenced uh, by, you know, the flows coming in from Michigan and Huron. Uh, similar, also kind of similar weather patterns influencing that lake. So you can see that lake did set record highs in 2019, uh, has continued to set uh, many record highs here in 2020. Uh, and the forecast would have us uh, maybe setting one more in June, falling a little bit below for the rest of the year. But again, you know, levels that are very close uh, to the previous record highs just set last year. Lake Erie. Uh, Again, blocked the record highs that were set last year. Uh, arrows pointing in the record highs that we've been experiencing on Lake Erie so far this year. Um, and again, we have, you know, Erie has started to dry up a little bit. Um, you know, we, at this point, we're not forecasting further record highs uh, this year. Uh, so the peak not quite as high as last year's, but, um, you know, again, for, it's very, very close to what we were experiencing last year, still very high, Some similar story. Uh, finally, getting to the um, other end of the basin, uh, again, you know, Lake Ontario certainly was in the same boat as all, all the other lakes last year with, uh, you know, extremely high levels, setting new record highs over the summer. Uh, but again, this is where we have started to see, uh, you know, a little bit of relief with uh, drying conditions for the Ontario Basin, um, and also importantly for the, you know, some of the bases downstream on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, allowing you know more outflow to be released out of Lake Ontario, and so uh, that's really helped to, to keep levels well off of the uh, the record highs from last year. Uh, and again, although they're still um, well above average, you know the forecasts show even with the wettest conditions, we shouldn't be uh, anywhere near the record highs that were experienced last year. I think that's uh, essentially all I have to present. I have a couple slides here uh, with uh, where to find uh, information about water levels and conditions that we post on our website through the Army Corps. So I'd encourage you all to, uh, you know, check out those links, uh, learn more about uh, current and forecasted situations, uh, along with some contact information for myself and my uh, my lead forecasters, so that we, you know, again, if uh, we can't get to your questions during this webinar, we'd be happy to follow up with you after. And with that, I think I'm ready to turn it over. All right, thank you. Thanks, John. And I have actually sent you a couple um, questions. Um, let me know one way or the other if they're appropriate for you or not. And I think I sent one to Jeff as well as we go through this. All right, um, our next speaker is Brandon Crumweedy from uh, basically the NOAA Office of Coastal Management. Um, and he can get the, as his title right there, Great Lakes Regional Spe Geospatial Coordinator. Um, going to talk a little bit more about coastal impact. So take it away, Brandon, and thank you. Right. Thanks, Doug. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks again. Um, and then just like John and, and Jeff, I'm going to uh, provide an update from our, our webinar that we did in April. So 
some of the slides may be a repeat, but they do contain uh, updated information since that past webinar. So with that said, oops, this. Um, John highlighted this already with regards to water levels um, compared to where things were back in April. Uh, when we look at June here, you know, Lake Michigan, Huron, St. Clair, and Erie are at or above record highs. And I left the circles in from the last uh, last webinar just to show our frame of reference here on how water levels have changed over the last uh, few months. And so, you know, looking at Lake Superior, for example, we can see that water levels are now much lower than what they were back in 2019. Uh, we've definitely heard about the high water levels in Lake Michigan, Huron, as well as Lake St. Clair, and then again with Lake Erie. And when we look at Lake Ontario, um, as Jeff's presentation alluded to, you know, with the change in precipitation regimes, we're definitely seeing much lower water levels also present in Lake Ontario. Um, this is a graphic uh, showing the precipitation departure from average from for all of last year, so January through December 2019. And as it's already been previously mentioned, you know, we were pretty much wet across the entire basin. Um, in other parts of the country, we're also dealing with a bunch of flooding along the Mississippi River and Missouri River and so forth. And so with that increased precipitation, you know, we definitely saw the increased water levels. And, you know, looking at it now, uh, from December 2019 to, to just last month, May of 2020, the only place where we're definitely seeing that increase in precipitation is, is right there in the center part of the Great Lakes Basin, as previously mentioned by both Jeff and John, um, and seeing those direct impacts to our water levels within Lake Siri, Huron, and uh, Michigan. And so, again, with these trends, um, you know, and the climate predictions that Jeff provided, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this continues on. Um, being located in Duluth, I can acknowledge that we are dry um, and we're in need of rain uh, for a couple of our locations further inland. So what I'm gonna highlight on uh, for this presentation is that interaction between the high water levels and the increased wind. Um, as Jeff said, you know, we are noticing some increased wind and it's having a direct impact along our shorelines with this increased volume of water. Um, and we've definitely been dealing with this over the last few years now. Um, the graphic on the left is what was provided in October of 2018, talking about how the high water levels together with the wind were going to cause 14 to 18 foot waves and have a direct impact to our coastal areas. And just for reference on the right is the NOAA Co-op's water level station in Duluth, uh, observing from just prior to the storm of uh, October 9th, uh, 2018 to October 11th of 2018. And so you can see that direct rise in water levels um, by 15 inches in just that 30 hour period. And then once the water levels were elevated, um, we had that increased wave in water action. And so kind of acting as a, I don't wanna say a chainsaw, but definitely that interaction with the sediments and the erosion, we definitely saw a lot of direct impacts uh, along the shoreline there. And it's not just in Duluth here um, that we're seeing this, it's obviously throughout the Great Lakes Basin. And so when we look at multiple years worth of data, we can see these large storm impacts, um, you know, October 27th of 2017, October 10th of 2018, October 21st of 2019. And when you start seeing these repeated events with the high water levels, it's continuing to take a battering against our shorelines and our infrastructure there. And so, you know, when we get to looking more specifically at a particular site, and again, as John provided the location of all those sites across the basin, they get averaged into the monthly average or the daily average for water levels. And so what I'm showing here in blue is the 2008, or sorry, 2019 uh, water levels overlaid now with what's being reported for 2020. And this is starting from March uh, 1st and goes to uh, December 1st to just show how these water levels have been interacting. And so last year was definitely a hard year in Duluth. We saw a lot of storm events, um, but if you look now and how regards to water level, you know, we're above the long-term average as John provided, uh, but we're not sitting at or near the, the near record highs as previously um, recorded. If we move over, for example, to Lake Michigan here on and look at the very Southern end of Lake Michigan there, 
and this is Calumet Harbor's co-op's water level station, uh, you can definitely see the increase in water levels and how we're, you know, some of these storm events are exceeding that orange line, which is the, the mean monthly record high uh, from the Michigan Huron Basin. And so definitely seeing increased erosion and direct impacts to our coastal areas on the, this is just for one geography in Lake Michigan and definitely seeing this in other locations as well. If we move over to Lake Erie, um, I mentioned in April, the large number of storm events towards the latter part of the season, um, you know, mid to late uh, November, or excuse me, mid October to late November. Um, and already we're starting to see these huge uh, storm events. Um, and again, right there about mid April, there was a large one that hit uh, Buffalo, New York. And so, the water levels again are sitting right at that record high and so when we see these storms it definitely is having a direct impact to to the coastal areas and then in lake ontario um you know this is reflective of oswego and the blue line again is 2019 compared to 2020 uh, with the red line and those water levels are lower than what we've seen previously um, going into this summer and so um Taking this into account, you know, the direct impacts that we see, of course, are the shoreline erosion. We see high turbidity in the coastal areas. Uh, we're seeing a lot of sediment moving around in the littoral zone. We're seeing alterations to the stream and river mouths. Our infrastructure is definitely taking a beating, um, as are the marinas and docks. Um, you know, these provide with additional debris floating in the water. It's a hazard to navigation. Um, and definitely for the loss of our coastal, terrestrial, and uh, wetlands and habitat that we see along these shorelines. Uh, we still do have a few beaches, especially in Michigan, Lake Michigan and, and Lake Huron, that are sitting underwater, so limiting how much use uh, those areas can provide. Um, but then also, too, the increased impacts when these storms are moving through. Um, so having elevated water levels plus the storm events is dramatically impacting uh, our shorelines. And again, we hear time and time again, the damage and loss of private property, houses falling in. Um, but again, our states are stepping up and you know expediting the permitting process to allow uh, temporary structures to be put in place to protect our shorelines. And again, just highlighting an example, this was you know within um, one week, the amount of change that we're seeing along our shorelines. And this is only one example. And we do see this time and time again across the basin where um, you know, you'll have so much beach and then after a storm event, uh, there's quite a bit of erosion um, as well as alterations to the shoreline. And so this is again, just seven days apart, um, you know, only a couple minutes uh, difference there as well. Um, with these high water levels, you know, we're definitely also seeing not those, only those individual storm event impacts, but the longer decadal change along our shorelines as well. And so this is an example from Illinois Beach State Park in Lake Michigan. Um, where you can see the coastal erosion uh, very vividly from 2008 to 2018. Um, but it's also interesting to see what's happening below the water as well. And so areas highlighted in red on that far right graphic are indi indicating um, erosion uh, that's occurring within our littoral zones. And the blue is actually where we're seeing some deposition of those eroded sediments. And so you can actually see these offshore bars developing um, again, with that increased sediment load available for, for transport. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see how it's altering not only our shorelines, but again, those offshore underwater structures as well. Again, talking about beach recreation, um, this was just from 2019, where we're looking at Ontario Beach. Um, it was difficult to see, but um, you can see where these are volleyball nets um, that basically are inaccessible or unusable um, to support localized recreation. Being a part of NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, we make a lot of data, tools, training, and resources available to our partners. Um, this includes things like the Lake Level Viewer tool to show impacts from inundation, allowing users to change water levels plus or minus six feet to have a sense of what may be impacted directly. Um, the data that's within that tool is publicly available. And in the lower left, you're actually seeing a digital elevation model um, that is available through that tool. 
And what's highlighted in red here is anything that falls between the record low and record high water levels. And this is helping coastal manager, managers, for example, here in Minnesota, to understand which parts of their shoreline are more susceptible to erosion uh, with these various storm events. And then in the lower right, um, again, we mentioned a lot of training and resources available. And so we do actually have a page fully dedicated to adaptation strategies. Um, you know, how do you deal with adapting to climate change or utilizing green infrastructure, nature-based infrastructure uh, for shoreline protection? And just wanting to highlight um, the lake level viewer here, what's nice about it is it can be used as a screening tool. Um, going back and looking at that storm from uh, October 21st, 2019, we can actually uh, set the water levels to 184.3 uh, meters. Uh, the long-term average is 184, or excuse me, 183.4 uh, meters. And we saw a difference about almost close to a full meter here, but you can see that um, some of the inundation that was occurring on the backside of uh, Minnesota Point there on the bay where there was actually some inundation and we did hear police reports that that was actually true. Um, so the tool was showing potential inundation from that event um, and again can help other communities along their shorelines when they look at you know what the water levels may potentially elevate to to determine what parts might be of concern uh, through coastal inundation. And similarly, too, we can look at Buffalo, New York. Um, you know, November 1st, 2019, uh, 176.59 meters. Long-term average is 175.14 meters. There was close to a difference of uh, one and a half meters of inundation or water level change here. And just to, to show, um, we actually maxed out the lake level viewer in terms of trying to visualize that plus six foot change in water levels. And so this actually caused us to rethink the tool and, and work towards improving it so that we are capturing um, those water levels that exceed even six feet um, in some of our geographies in the Great Lakes. Lastly, um, I just want to point out that within each of the Great Lakes states, uh, we do have a coastal zone management program. Um, there are wonderful resources and people to work with that can point you to the right locations when you're dealing with coastal erosion um, or, you know, user case studies um, to connect you with. And so we re really, really depend on our state partners, and not only conveying the message back to us about the impacts that are happening on the shoreline, but providing them the resources they need um, to their coastal communities as well. So with that, I'll leave my contact information. Please feel free to give me a call or send me an email if you have any questions and hope to help you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. We're gonna switch over to Gary here. Uh, Gary's with the National Weather Service based in Cleveland. He manages that office. Yep, we see all your slides. Okay, can you hear me, Doug? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sound good. Okay, all right, good afternoon, everybody. As Doug says, uh, my name is Gary Garnett. I'm the meteorologist in charge here at the National Weather Service in Cleveland. Um, touch base with what we do uh, when it comes to the, the uh, water levels. Um, we issue uh, warnings, watches, advisories um, for the episodic events like Brandon was talking about. Um, the wind and waves have significant impacts on uh, the lake levels. And of course, when they're high, as we all know, the wind and wave action uh, can, can be fairly destructive and, and have significant impacts. Uh, the first slide I have are the, are the three main tools that we go to uh, when we think we're going to have an episodic weather event that is going to have impacts on the Great Lakes. Uh, the Lakeshore Flood Warning is, is, is our um, most significant product that we issue. Uh, we issue this product when there is significant coastal flooding either occurring or it's imminent. Um, some of the larger scale events we've, we've had recently, uh, warnings are out for. Uh, Lakeshore Flood Watch means that either uh, minor coastal flooding is occurring or there is a potential for a significant event within a few days. Uh, if we see an event approaching, um, but we don't have significant confidence on what the impacts will be, oftentimes we'll put a watch out till it gets a little bit closer um, and we can determine what the impacts will be. Now, Lakeshore uh, Flood Advisory, 
uh, is only issued by a few offices on the Western Lakes. And these are issued for minor coastal flooding events uh, that don't have necessarily a large impact, uh, but not all offices uh, do issue the advisory, but all of them do issue warnings and watches. So this is an example um, by our office in Buffalo, New York of what a lakeshore uh, flood warning looks like. Uh, you can see from the headlines, um, we do put a time window in there uh, when we do expect the impacts. This one happened to be from noon until 8 a.m. Tuesday uh, back in April when we had a pretty big event up in the Buffalo area. Um, we do uh, a, uh, outline the area. Uh, you can see this was for Niagara area, Erie and Chautauqua counties. Uh, then we get into impacts uh, where we try to describe the impacts of what this event will do. Um, with the lake levels being higher here over the last couple of years, our impact databases are expanding as we work with local community leaders, uh, emergency managers on determining exactly what some of these impacts are uh, with some of these events. Uh, we're, we're able to define the impacts a little bit better in our warning statements. We issue, um, when we put out these warnings, advisories, watches, um, we do provide graphics, uh, social media, things like Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, we do put things out on the internet on our web pages. Uh, this is an example of some of the type of graphics we put out. So this one was done here by the office in Cleveland. Uh, if you look up on the upper right, uh, up towards Erie, Pennsylvania, you can see some dark green. Uh, showing you this is a lakeshore flood warning. So either uh, the, the uh, was going to be imminent with the flooding or was already occurring. Uh, here in northeast part of Ohio, for Geneva on the lake, Conneaut, uh, there was a lakeshore flood watch, meaning that the conditions weren't quite creating flooding, but there was some potential we could have flooding. So it was uh, uh, being monitored for potential. Another example, uh, this is a briefing done by the Buffalo office. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all offices do issue the, the watches and warnings. Uh, most offices, if not all, do some type of briefing package or graphics that I'm showing you that are readily available uh, to help you understand what's going on with some of these events. Once again, upper left graphical representation of where the Lakeshore flood warning is. Um, on the right in this potential graphic, you can see they put the start time for the strongest winds. Uh, as we're finding out, and, and of course it's, it's fairly evident, uh, the wind direction and, and speed uh, has a significant impact on uh, you know, where the highest flooding is going to occur, where the impacts from the flooding are going to occur, particularly with wave action. Uh, and even slight wind direction changes as much as 10 to 20 degrees can have a huge impact on where the worst flooding is going to occur. Our office in Detroit um, does something a little bit different, a uh, very unique concept. Uh, they have a, uh, a lakeshore flooding dashboard. Um, this is their dashboard here uh, for Port Huron. Um, and it provides a little more detailed information, particularly with the wind and the waves uh, that maybe some of the other offices don't aren't providing now in this type of format. Um, the graphical re representation, the upper left of, of where the warnings are at. Um, the upper right side is a graphical re representation of the current water levels uh, there for Port Huron and the forecast of what the water levels will be. The lower left is a graphical representation of the probability of reaching certain wind speeds. Um, so you can see um, in this that at about three o'clock, three to six o'clock on April 13th was the probably the window of the highest probability of the strongest winds. Uh, and the, the probabilities ranged anywhere from being 80% of, of winds in the 33 knot range to, uh, you know, a low likelihood of 50 knot winds, which was, you know, down less than 10%, probably more in the, the three to 5% range. Uh, go back to that real quick. 
Um, but you could see from that, that graphic, uh, get a good window of when your strongest winds are at least expected to be. And the lower right-hand side is a similar distribution, but this is for waves and wave heights. And uh, they're giving you probabilities of what uh, the, the waves could be. And in this example, uh, the, the darker gray uh, would be four foot waves and they had the highest probabilities being upwards almost to near 100%. And then getting down into the blue, uh, which are wave heights around six feet were down as much as 30 to 40% uh, around four o'clock. So um, this dashboard, another useful tool um, in determining probabilities. Maybe you're concerned when winds get to uh, 40 knots and, and waves get to six to eight feet, uh, you know you're going to have certain impacts. So uh, these types of distributions are uh, uh, potentially a wave of the future, uh, how we're going, um, providing information for the lake shores. Other graphical information. Um, these are graphics um, provided by the National Weather Service, some of our forecast graphics, and also some of the information provided by GLARL, uh, Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System. Uh, very um, uh, useful information uh, back to, uh, you know, earlier statements almost from everybody with the impacts of the wind and the waves. Uh, the, the upper left, the wind graphic forecast from the National Weather Service in this particular event, which happened to be April 13th of this year, um, it was a strong westerly wind event on Lake Erie. Uh, you can see the strongest winds were up on the eastern end of the lake where there were potentially over 35 knots forecast. In the upper right was our wave forecast. And uh, of course, no surprise, the stronger winds on the east end of the lake, the longer fetch, the higher wave action was expected up near Buffalo, where there could be upwards of maybe 12 to 15 foot waves up on the eastern end. Uh, the lower left showing the displacement of the water on Lake Erie, uh, the significant rise of Buffalo, potentially six feet rise, uh, and then a six foot potential six foot drop there on the blue line, uh, which is Toledo. And then a uh, Another representation of that displacement in the lower right, um, showing the, the rise near the eastern end and, and the lowering on the left. So this station effect takes uh, uh, place with these winds. Um, so there are some nice graphical representations out there available uh, to help you deal with these storm event, episodic storm events. Some of the challenges that we're facing uh, with these higher water levels is that some of the levels on the lakes are at levels that you would normally issue an advisory watch or potentially even a warning for. Um, so there's almost a new normal because um, some areas now are, are just constantly flooded um, that, that normally weren't when levels were lower uh, a few years ago. So we're recalibrating, working with local community leaders uh, to try to make sure that these warnings, watches, and advisories are of value, uh, that they are highlighting these episodic events where there is uh, you know, potential for significant impact. So these are some of the challenges we're running into, um, but we're getting a lot of good information and, and we're refining our approach. Other challenges um, that occur for us is the effect on recreational uh, activities on the lakes. Um, you know, several people have already mentioned a lot of these marinas are, are flooded uh, for recreational boaters getting out on the lake. Uh, another huge impact we have are rip currents and swimming on the lake. Uh, with the higher water levels, the, uh, the, the shoreline's changing. Uh, the rip currents um, are acting a little bit different and in some cases more severe. Um, so we're trying to provide information uh, regarding that to uh, recreation beachgoers uh, so that they can be aware of the changes and some of the hazards that uh, may not be obvious. Here's where all the different offices are across the Great Lakes uh, for the NOAA National Weather Service. Uh, there are several of them. Uh, each of them have a different area of responsibility along the lakes. 
All of them are providing some types of lakeshore uh, flooding information. Um, depending on which office you are, the information may be slightly different, but I do uh, um, ask that if you would need more information regarding this to reach out uh, to your local National Weather Service office to see what information they provide. Websites um, that are available, lots of good information. Uh, the one in the upper left is just weather.gov. Uh, that's all your forecast information uh, that you could want anywhere in the Great Lakes region by simply clicking on that map and drilling down to your local office. There's also another um, web page weather.gov slash Great Lakes, which is very specific to the Great Lakes and has uh, wind, wave, and, and other information uh, just specific to this region. So two good, good resources, uh, websites for you to start um, to either reach out to your local National Weather Service office or get weather information specific to your area. And with that, Doug, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll leave that up there for a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to go, for, well, thanks to all the speakers. Excellent job again. Uh, this is being recorded, I think, in a couple of different places. I, uh, we have put uh, where to go eventually to retrieve the recording as well as the PDFs, uh, if you will, the presentations that each of the speakers provided. So that'll all be available. Um, now. Uh, there are several questions. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, I, I think uh, Jennifer and I and some of the others, Jennifer Day who's also on this call from NOAA and uh, Lauren Fry, uh, we've been talking about when or if we should do another one of these and it seems like a few months from now, maybe even as we sort of enter the, the cooler season of the year, October, November, something like that. Uh, maybe we'll refresh this whole situation or refresh this uh, uh, presentation with the current situation as it stands, uh, whether you know lakes are going up or down or whatever, since we're uh, going to be entering a kind of kind of a uh, another vulnerable uh, period uh, in the fall when the winds come up and all that business. So um, we're looking at that. We don't have a date, but that'll be something we can. Um, we'll, we'll definitely send out more information on if and when that happens. Okay. So getting to the questions. Jennifer, is there anything else we need to do before that or say? Sorry, I had to okay. unmute myself. Um, I think we're in good shape right now. All right. So I'm going to go down the list of questions. Some of these may or may not pertain um, to anybody on the call. And if that's the case, I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer to say that's not getting covered on this call. <laughs> or we will deal with that in a different way or something like that. So um, one of the one of the sort of interesting questions, I sent this to Jeff Andreessen to see if he had any ideas, but uh, lately they've noticed that under high pressure, very still water on the lake, Lake Michigan and Huron, uh, that Michigan gauges are higher than Huron gauges. Uh, any idea why this would be happening uh, during days, again, of high pressure, no significant uh, flow slash wind, or flow through the straits. Uh, and then, you know, very specifically, he gave a couple uh, uh, values. And Jeff, do you have any comment, or anybody else have any comment on why that might be? I think I, I think it almost might be a technology question for one of our hydrologists. Uh, and and I'm not familiar with the technology of the of the gauges themselves, but um, I can't think. I really can't think of any any reason other than than the sensors. But I, it, it that may have been may have been something engineered out. But I I I'd, I'd probably pass on that one right. too for my colleagues well if anybody has a comment please uh please feel free to comment the difference is 0. 0.3 feet so it's a few inches yeah. and it may be a technological uh within the error bar thing as jeff says hey this is john I thought, yeah i'm not sure i've got a great answer i'd have to look at the data specifically but um you know i guess i would speculate if it was if it's something we're seeing recently if you know i I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, this last storm that went through, you know, in May, which really heavily hit the Michigan Huron or the Michigan Basin, even more than the Huron Basin, may have caused some temporary rises and tributary inflows near gauges that may be slightly skewing up the Michigan numbers over Huron. But, but again, I'd have to dig into the longer term nature of that to see if this is something consistent or 
it's event driven. Okay, and John, this is sort of a general. Thank you. Oh, oh somebody else. Okay, um, this is sort of a general question. I'm not sure uh, how to answer it, but why why is uh, the information not being used to manage Lake Ontario? Understanding that all the Great Lakes are higher than normal, um, and I think you alluded to why. But anyway, uh, that it is even more important for Lake Ontario level to down to an elevation of uh, 243.3 or lower to receive not only the other Great Lakes but water generate water generator from rain snow within the lake uh, Ontario basin uh, the outflows it goes on to state the outflows uh, last year were 10,004 cubic feet per second and now at 9400 uh, the question is why uh, since Lake Ontario is the basin for all Great Lakes it's even more important now to, uh, um, and maybe would be considered uh, negligent if everything is not down to lower Lake Ontario before next spring. In other words, I think, why, why don't we lower the levels more? Yeah, so I, I can try and generally answer that. You know, I get <laughs> getting at why, you know, why isn't more water being released out of Lake Ontario, you know, because of all the high water conditions. Um, you know, I'm not part of the Lake Ontario Board of Control that operates under the IJC. Uh, you know, but I'm, I guess I'm close enough to give a general answer of, um, you know, the, the amount of water that's released out of Lake Ontario is a balance, you know, not just between Ontario's level, but, you know, conditions downstream of the St. Lawrence River. And so, um, so again, I believe the plan is, you know, doing its best to balance uh, impacts upstream, you know, on Ontario with downstream impacts on the St. Lawrence. Um, I'll say that the, you know, during this high level period, uh, the Ontario Board has been looking for ways to, you know, release more water as much as possible, you know, during these extremes and um, through the uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Adaptive Management Committee that reports to the Great Lakes Boards, um, which I'm a member of, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for ways to tweak the regulation plan in place on Lake Ontario to, again, help better manage uh, some of these extreme conditions we've been seeing. Okay. Um, there's a follow-up question from a different person, interestingly, uh, about the Niagara water flows are managed by the IJC's International Niagara Border Control. We just said what adjustments have been made uh, to better uh, manage periodic high uh, NBS periods, um, what efforts have been made to manage high water flows relative to recommend recommendations made in the 1993 levels reference study. And I think you might have addressed this mostly, John, already. Well, um, you know, I guess I'll address Niagara River specifically, um, you know, since this is something I didn't have time to catch in my presentation, you know, uh, you know, I guess he points out that the IJC has a control board that manages levels or flows in the Niagara River, um, which is true. There's you know, the amount of water that is uh, sent over the falls versus uh, used for hydropower production uh, that goes around the falls, uh, that split. Uh, is overseen and managed by an international control board, but the total amount of flow uh, leaving Lake Erie through the Niagara River cannot be controlled. That that is, the water is either going over the falls or it's going over or going through the hydropower plants, and that split can be controlled. But that total amount of water is leaving no matter what. So um, there's really nothing of uh, significance that could be done along the Niagara River to you know help much in the high water situation. Okay, thank you. Um, if there were no lock between Superior and Huron, Michigan, uh, what would happen to those lake levels generally, I think? Jeez, I mean, I guess if there were no lock, that means there is no more, I think they're implying if there's just no control, you know, it was allowed to free flow maybe between the two yeah. lakes. I mean, certainly you'd see a general lowering again of Superior and maybe a general raising of Michigan here on in relation to each other. Um, certainly the larger impacts, you know, would be the impact that would have on the commercial shipping <laughs> throughout the Great Lakes, it would be devastating. So it would come with a lot of other impacts of trying to do something like that. Right, I think also, this is Jennifer, um, I think the Board of Control actually keeps that type of data. For example, I know they keep the level like if there had been no controls or locks or dams put on um, the St. Lawrence River, what would happen to the level of Lake Ontario? 
And in that case, Lake Ontario, because of the deepening, you know, to, to make um, it a, a seaway basically for ships, Lake Ontario would be like, I don't know, something like 30 inches higher than it is now if there were no dams or locks or controlled flow out um, through that river. And so I'm thinking that the Lake Superior Board of Control might also have that information uh, for that system through the St. Mary's River. Thank you. Now, yes, we do have, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry, I would say, yes, through the Superior Board, we do have what we call what the pre-project relationship is. So what the flow would have been, you know, had there been no structure. So it is something that we could model to see what would happen. Um, sort of a climatological question for you, Jeff, I think. Um, Michigan Huron has has had low seasonal declines, both in the fall of 2018 and 19. Uh, what conditions would it take, uh, and what would be uh, to get a good, if you will, seasonal decline in the fall of 2020? Um, and is it, uh, I think the question is, is it related, uh, is there any ENSO relationship or other long-term uh, forecast tools that would uh, uh, help us uh, know that, I think? Well, and, and it, I'll, I'll start and, and maybe uh, uh, and kick off uh, over to, to John, perhaps. But uh, if you think of that balance, if uh, if one were looking for a, a larger than normal decline, you would probably want to enhance evaporation, the loss of water from the basin, and uh, and reduce the, the input, uh, which, of course, would be precipitation. So the uh, combination of, of that would probably be a, a warm and dry uh, fall or late summer and, and fall to, uh, to speed up or to accelerate the, the seasonal drop off. That's just, a, I guess, a very, very early or uh, simple, simplified way of looking at that. In terms of ENSO, it's a bit more complicated, but the, the links with ENSO in the transitional seasons are relatively weak. Uh, we see our strongest statistical correlation with with what happens climatologically meteorologically uh, in the in the, the Great Lakes basin during the winter a little bit lesser extent in the uh, in the summer and, and spring is a, a little bit as well but it's it drops off uh, from that when when we get to the transitions uh, so there there isn't much I'm not aware of anything that really stands out as being a, for for Enso. We, we typically see, of course, the, the, the one that we know more than any other relationship, the, the ENSO relationship in the winter when we, we typically see uh, El Nino as a warm event in the Pacific. Uh, the winters tend to be uh, milder and drier than normal across much of the northern U.S., including the Great Lakes Basin, and a little bit in reverse uh, when we look at, at La Nina. And, and, of course, that's what our, our outlook is hinting at now, the long leads, the possibility of a a La Nina, but I would also uh, caveat that with the fact that at this point in time, even if there is a La Nina, it, it's still thought to be only marginal. And that typically the larger, the, the stronger the event is, either El Nino or La Nina, the, the more likely we are to see some of these, these climatic associations. And again, right now, the, the thought is that at this point, it would, it would maybe only be weak. So I don't know that we'll see much this year, this calendar year, certainly the rest of the uh, the, the fall and into the winter linked with uh, with with ENSO. And I, and I with that I'd, I'd certainly invite comments from from John or from Brandon. Uh, any other comments on what it would take? I don't think so. I, I think he covered that well. You know, you'd also hope for I guess a cold cold and dry winter to help drive some of that evaporation up higher over the winter. But you know, otherwise, yeah, I think those would be the conditions you'd be looking for. Can the next question is uh, can the Chicago River and Calumet uh, River locks be open to allow extra outflow from Lake Michigan? Yeah, so um, you know, I guess a little, a little detail on that. So that's describing the Chicago diversion uh, down to Chicago, uh, where a small amount of water is diverted out of Lake Michigan, uh, and for shipping and sanitary reasons in that area. Uh, and, and I guess that has been investigated several times over the last decades as we've dealt with high water is the question of how much more water could you divert out uh, through the Chicago diversion during these high water periods uh, to see if you could get any relief. Um, and, I, you know, I guess ultimately, I think what it's come down to, you know, one, this isn't, this is, 
um, isn't something controlled by the IJP or the control boards that manage flows. This is uh, a you know flow value set by a Supreme Court decree that would I think the change would require uh, kind of a complicated approval process between the states uh, and our provinces. But um, I, you know I guess a couple of things that um, yes in theory it can be done. Uh, it would have potential significant uh, impacts to the local Chicago area. Uh, and then, you know, in the Illinois River watershed, um, you know, and it's a very small amount of water that would give you very minimal uh, relief, um, you know, to water levels on, on Michigan and Huron, I guess. For example, we've, we've, we've modeled, uh, you know, what, what could be done and what uh, impacts you could get. And if you were to, uh, you know, triple the amount of water leaving through that diversion than, than what's, you know, currently allowed, um, again, which would be very significant and could have significant impacts. Um, if you tried to do that for a year, you're talking about uh, a little over an inch of relief that you could lower uh, the level of Michigan year on. So, so again, that you know, help put in context of what what can be done there, and uh, you know, the impacts that you could actually get from doing that. Okay. Um... Just a general question of what trends and inputs are being observed in Canada. I assume they're about the same as what they are in the US. Any comments on that from anyone? Yeah, I'm not sure I can think of anything different. You know, that I think all the you know general statements and comments that we have uh you know been going over here, I think apply to the Canadian part of the watershed as well. Okay. Uh, this is Lauren and I can I'll just add to that. This is Lauren Fry. I'm at NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. And um, so, so when we're tracking the water budget components, we are always looking on both sides of the border. There's significant uh, collaboration between the U.S. and Canadian federal agencies to track those, those things. So when we're, when we're talking about trends that are happening in the basin, we're, we're generally talking about uh, Great Lakes basin-wide trends. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip down. There's a whole bunch of questions about where can we get uh, copies of this, and I think we've put that in the chat uh, and the recording and the PDF. They'll be online in a few days. Um, uh, there's a question about when Brandon's using a long-term average. Is he looking at the LTA uh, from lakewide average or individual station average? And Brandon, I'll just say what you said. Yes, the lake level viewer uses the lake-wide long-term average. Uh, this is uh, also the value that I am referring to in the graphical plots in each of the uh, four NOAA co-op sites I provided. Okay, so moving down a little bit more. Gary, this might be more for you. Can, can more details on Lake Erie Western Basin be provided? This was during your talk, and that's why I'm pointing at you. No. Go ahead. Um, Toledo what? and Detroit are both on the western end and uh, dealing with a lot of problems. Um, you know, there's specific water, you know, with, with the water level gauges, um, specific information and forecasts, of, you know, available for all those points. Um, it, it's difficult to um, give specific information unless we have a water level gauge at, you know, the location. Uh, so we're somewhat limited to that, um, but uh, you know we give um, the information we have. Um, if there's specific information that's not being provided, uh, if you contact your local weather service office, they may be able to be a little more helpful. Uh, for us, uh, would be Toledo. For for Detroit, obviously the Detroit White Lake office. Okay. Um, next question, Jeff. Uh, are there any published resources that analyze climate change impacts on the frequency and intensity of wind events that drive coastal flooding events on the Great Lakes? That's a that's a really good question. Uh, I am a I am aware of a couple of studies that deal with wind in a more generic sense. Uh, and and interestingly, and I. The ones I, the studies I'm aware of actually suggest in the distant future, we're talking decades out, there might actually be a little bit of a decrease in the mean wind. But that's the really important distinction here. There's 
wind, mean wind, and then there's these extreme events. And there's a lot more interest, of course, for many, uh, many groups, organizations, uh, people on the extreme events. And unfortunately, because of the way these climate simulations work, and, and they're, they're largely, they're relatively coarse scale, uh, they, don't do, they don't do those extreme events very well. So I think, I think the jury is still out on that. But there are many, many related questions that I, I just don't know. That there, I, I'm not aware of, of anyone who's come up with a, a definitive answer for that, this particular type of, uh, of question. It's a really good one, and, and it's one that, that needs work, but I just don't know that the, the model projections handle that very well yet. Okay. Um, there are some comments about Governor Cuomo uh, increasing uh, flow, and just wondering if that, uh, uh, or, or uh, yes. Yeah, Let's see, requesting increased flow out of Ontario, if I have that right, and just wondering if that had any effect on the lower lake uh, levels. I guess, you know, just generally, you know, the same answer I gave earlier that, you know, that the board has been looking for any and all ways to be you know, squeezing more water out, especially late last year into early this year. Um, and so, so certainly any little bit of water that they've been able to release out of Lake Ontario has um, you know, help to reduce the level a bit. Yep. Um, back to you, Jeff. Uh, it, it didn't seem as if we offered any evidence to suggest the current water levels represent a particular trend or a particular uh, multi-year variation. Is that true? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure if I understand the question maybe correctly, but on the surface, there, there's very strong evidence that that the current levels are, are in response to, uh, I think we could say an unprecedented wet period and uh, what are the normal period in our, in our, at least our recorded history back at least 150 years. I think almost by every metric I can think of, the last decade to 20 years are, are the, the wettest such period in our, in our recorded history. And I think that is playing, well, it, it almost certainly plays a, a major role in a, at least describing the, the current levels. There was another, I think there was a variability though portion of this particular question as well. That can, can Trend repeat? versus multi-year variation, yeah. Uh, well, one of the one of the real, really interesting pieces of this is, and I, I think uh, John pointed this out very well, is that we went from one of the relatively lowest levels uh, in the lakes uh, here not too long ago, uh, just several years ago, to one of the highest, if not the highest, level in a relatively short period of time and that's always the the variability is always an, i think an underappreciated part of this uh, this argument that very 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 important and it, it it played a role here um but i think as also as john mentioned that the levels that we have still are are generally within the bounds of those that have been observed over the long period but again as far as the the driving climatic part of this uh, we're warmer and we're wetter than we were uh, in, in past decades, but especially we're wetter, and and that that has to have played a, a significant role in uh, in what we're seeing. And also, the, there's some other part, portions of this. Uh, a couple of very severe winters, especially the winter of 2013, 2014, also played a very very well real uh, role in in, uh, in in the reversal from the very very dry or very very low levels to the very high levels because of its uh, impact on the, the again, a, a wet, cold winter played a, a, a huge role. So with some of the timing of that and all of those things collectively uh, have resulted in a, again, a highly variable, at least on the decadal type time scale. I don't know, John, do you have any follow-up thoughts on that? I think you answered that really well. Okay, I mean, we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on. We got a bunch more questions. I, that's good enough. Um, uh, there are, uh, are there any tools out, this is more for Brandon, I think, uh, estimating coastal flooding inundation, uh, uh, looking for tools, database, and potential storm surge heights. Uh, appreciate the weather service forecast warnings for specific uh, events, uh, but for coastal zone planning, is there some values we could use? Yeah, so in terms of the tool that actually does that, that is, 
something actually we're looking to to increase here in the region we do have what's called the coastal flood exposure mapper uh, that's used in other parts of the coastal areas of the u.s uh, the one thing that we're lacking right now is finalized fema flood mapping guidance uh, to make that tool complete for the great lakes region um, but in terms of yeah calculating out you know areas of inundation or storm surge or impacts from sage the lake level viewer itself does not uh, do that right now. Um, we approach the modeling kind of just from the simplified bathtub modeling approach for the lake level viewer. So if everything, if water levels go up by a foot, everything around the entire basin goes up by a foot within that tool. Um, so we do not bring in that localized uh, coastal flooding or inundation um, or storm surge okay. impacts. Okay. Um, and it's just an observation, Lake Michigan and Huron often are referred to as one lake as far as the lake level is concerned. Why is Lake Erie lower despite no barriers? Just a simple geography um, and the terrain that allows that differentiation. John, do you know what the change in elevation is from the outflow of Lake Huron to the input of Lake Erie? It's only a couple, a few feet, isn't it? I was going to say, I'd have to look back at my slide, but yeah, I think it's back on the profile roughly uh, in my earlier slides. Um, thermal expansion play a role in lake levels? Is it enough water for that to matter? Um, that's, that's a good question. Uh, yes, it does. Um, I believe there have been some studies, Canadians, on to quantify that um it's it's not much uh but uh but yeah i think it, it, it is measurable um and uh you know I, I i don't know if lauren if you're a little more tied into some of the work that's been done there but it is, it is a good question it does have a slight impact but not a big impact on the levels yeah this is lauren um so there is some impact but we generally like from a water balance perspective kind of lump that into uh um error uncertainty term um along with other things that that have small or um difficult to measure measure impacts like groundwater inflow for example so that gets lumped all into an error term okay um i'm going to keep going here i i think we can get to the end of these questions if i just uh plod through them hopefully everybody can stay on who asked <laughs> uh are you aware, aware of any similar products to the lake level viewer for coastal inundation on the Canadian coastline for Great Lakes? So that's a really good question, Doug. And it's actually one of the things that we've been encouraged by our Canadian colleagues to incorporate is the Canadian side within the NOAA lake level viewer. Um, the biggest setback to date has been the availability of high resolution elevation data on the Canadian side. However, uh, they have worked to collect that over the last couple of years now, and we are in discussions with them about the potential of incorporating that to make it a seamless product for both sides of the basin. Um, we're currently in discussion right now for further developments and you know, what's the new bells and whistles we want to put on the Lake Level Viewer. So we're really encouraging people to provide feedback um, to, to us on that. Um, but certainly that may be something in the future that will be incorporated into that tool. Okay. Um, Jeff and or Gary, uh, how do, basically do we somehow gauge uh, evaporation rates? What's, how do we do that? Collectively over the lakes, you think? Is that what the... Uh, yeah, probably. It's... Uh, it's estimated it's it's a difficult thing to do i guess that's that's the most important thing and i we may go to lauren about this right. it, it's a, i was going to say that i i thought glarell had a few uh stations that monitored evaporation rates yeah. on the lakes but there's only a couple there's not not very many that's right yeah that, that's right yeah lauren do you want to comment on that yeah, so there there are a handful of stations operated by a few different organizations that that actually do measure the flux of of water vapor from the lakes. Um, but primarily, when you're when if you see numbers for like lake wide evaporation, uh, those would be provided by model output. Um, in terms of observational uh, data, we really just have a very sparse network 
of, of gauges that are, are useful from the point of view of, of tuning the models that we, um, that we use to simulate and forecast evaporation. Thank you. Um, so we need more of those. <laughs> it would help a lot. Um, can satellites be used to monitor lake levels? Yes, ISAT2 does have a sensor on it that allows you to actually measure not only the lake level, but also um, provide some near shore bathymetry information. Um, does the lack of winter lake ice in uh, lack of winter uh, winter ice basically uh, impact wind fetch and therefore lake level readings? I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Um, uh, yeah, I think the question is I, I think there's yeah, warmer water, less ice. Does that affect the, the lake level reading since it's an average of, you know, as opposed to ice and ice covered lakes? I don't think it, you know, from a lake wide average perspective, you know, the, the, the network's been designed to balance those kinds of. It, you know, short-term events and factors out. So I, I would say no from a lake-wide average perspective. Okay. Um, okay, what is the overall overall prediction for water levels in Lake Huron? Oh, <laughs> for the next five years. <laughs> yeah, um, it's difficult enough just for us to forecast six months out. <laughs> so um, further than that and you really don't have much to go on besides just uh, you know basic climatology. So um, we have, uh, I believe we have a two to five year outlook product to give you some idea of, uh, you know, I guess under basic trends, what levels could do. But, uh, but again, it's not, you know, I wouldn't call it a forecast. It's really just a, more of a probability output product at that point. Okay. Um, if Okay, if the outflows were increased to Chicago and Calumet, uh, would that increase flooding in the Illinois and Mississippi rivers? And I would say, and I, I'll just say, it could if those uh, rivers were already in flood, but I'm sure there would there would be precautions taken for that. Um, moving on, uh, uh, just an FYI, yes, locks can be opened. Diversion is operated in 1940s to 8,000 cubic feet versus court action 3.2 okay um i'm going to move on is there a one-stop shopping website to find soil saturation soil saturation or soil moisture rates and that's a good question go ahead jeff <laughs> there uh it's there are a couple sites one from noah's uh, climate prediction center that might be where i would start and just just google NOAA Climate Prediction Center and Soil Moisture Monitoring. And actually some of the, a couple of the images that I, I shared uh, are, are, are operationally updated every day. That's, that's a generic start to that. If you wanna get down to smaller levels and, and to more detail, then it, it, it gets, there are many fewer options uh, to do this, but it's, uh, and, and well, the National Weather Service is involved in, in, in simulating this, and, and Gary, you may want to comment on this too, on, on, uh, on what's done relative to soil moisture and, and flooding potential and risk, but that's, that's something that, that is, it is operationally monitored more and more and more uh, with time. Yeah, the uh, the soil moisture, um, our river forecast centers, uh, you know, really have a handle on that information provided obviously for for flooding and flash flooding so um you know the ohio river forecast center the uh you know uh, would would be a another good starting point okay. um okay we're almost done here can increased precip be one of the causes for high lake levels i think the answer to that is yes uh is the increased precip due to warmer atlantic and gulf temperature Temps uh, bringing more moisture in the Great Lakes, and I think that's partially a yes as well. Jeff, do you have anything else? Yeah, it's also again, there's the behavior, jet stream behavior is is definitely been linked with it. But all these things collectively have have added up to more water vapor and more more precip events and more more precip in the region. Okay. And here's the final question: uh, 
says, considering the weather pattern you described, and I'm assuming that's you, Jeff, in a very high cycle, uh, I'm not sure what very high cycle means, but what alterations to plan 2012 and 2014 to accommodate these unforeseen volumes of water, the level of flooding cannot be sustained across the Great Lakes. Okay, kind of a question comment there. Yeah, it, it, this is Jennifer, and and again, you know, we're part of NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers, obviously, but I don't think really on this um, call can we start, you know, making predictions or um, answer questions about um, the plans that are put in place by the IJC. All right, so I'm going to say thank you one more time to all of the speakers and those who uh, those others on the panelist list that helped answer some of the questions at the end. Uh, I want to thank all of you 239 people who stuck it out to the bitter end, uh, went over time a little bit. Uh, thank you for listening in. Um, I'm going to conclude this and hopefully we can um, get something together for later this fall or in the fall, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to thank everybody and thank you, Jennifer and everybody else. So I'm going to sign off everybody and we're just going to be done today. Thank you very much.